Hello, everyone. Welcome to our session about the end of today. Maybe this is one of the last sessions you are joining now. I'm moderating the session, uh, which is about educational and support strategies during humanitarian crisis. My name is Nevgül Bilsel Safkan. I'm the general manager of Sabancı Foundation. For those who cannot see me, I'm a white woman with brown hair, green eyes. I'm having a black jacket and with a white blouse in it. Uh, I will be moderating the session and we will focus on early childhood intervention, inclusive care and resilient education models to support refugees and internally disabled people with disabilities. We will learn about five great examples from different parts of the world. My foundation, Sabancı Foundation, is one of the largest philanthropic organizations in Turkey. Our vision is to create a society where individuals enjoy their rights equally. Our target groups include women, youth and people with disabilities. As it's very much related with our topic, I would like to share some information about Turkey in terms of refugees. According to UNHCR 2023 data, Turkey hosts 3.4 million refugees. This is the largest refugee population worldwide. Also, the percentage of people with disabilities in this community is not known exactly. The estimate is around 24%. Many conflicts and associated health problems, of course, contributed to this high rate. Many refugees face challenges in terms of food security, livelihoods, shelter, health, protection and education. According to a field study conducted by Senate organization from Turkey, only 6% of refugees are employed officially. There are many problems in accessing health services as well due to financial problems, language barriers and lack of sufficient information. Intersectional groups such as disabled refugee children face different and more intense challenges. Senate organizations field research sheds light on access to education in this issue. The survey showed that 92% of children with disabilities do not have reports that enable them to benefit from special education. School enrollment rate is very low, which is 57%. These rates show that there is an urgent need for accessible information and consultation services, as well as inclusive education opportunities. So I try to explain the challenges faced in Turkey a bit, but unfortunately similar emergencies and humanitarian crises are happening in various parts of the world. At this point, we hope for a world where we can prevent or minimize the impacts of humanitarian crisis and where no one is forced to migrate involuntarily. Today, our focus will be on solutions and mutual learning from each other. Now, I would like to introduce our presenters to you. We'll see amazing organizations from Palestine, Belgium, Austria, and Kenya. In the first two presentations, we will listen to Dima al Junaidi and Jamil Darbashi from Palestinian Center for Communication and Development Strategies. Welcome. And then Sean Tesni from Christian Blind Mission. You're welcome to. They will talk about the initiatives they have implemented to ensure access to inclusive education for children with disabilities in Palestine. In this regard, I would like to express how saddened we feel in the face of the ongoing humanitarian crisis in Palestine. 
We hope for a peaceful sol solution resolution to be achieved as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Then we'll listen to solutions developed to support Ukrainian disabled refugees living in different countries. While Tiziana and Lisa from the European Association of Service Providers for Persons with Disabilities will talk about the situation in six different countries, Johannes, Fellinger and Stephanie, they will from, from the Hospital of St. John of Godlind Gold will elaborate on their efforts in Austria. I would also like to repeat my wishes for peace regarding the ongoing occupation of Ukraine since 2022. And lastly, we will listen to Eva, Eva Dizenia from Christian Blind Mission. She will talk about the migrations resulting from drought in Kenya, Turkana district and solutions created for inclusive education access for children with dis disabilities in refugee camps. Before giving the word to them, I would like to mention the terrible earthquake that affected Turkey and Syria last year. Also, it has been one year now. Efforts regarding inclusive education in the disaster region are still very limited. The process has not yet returned to normal. Addressing emergency situations resulting from natural disasters alongside human-made crisis is also very important to us to gain a comprehensive perspective. Now, Dima and Jamil, could you please tell us about your project implemented in West Bank? Hello everyone, I hope you are doing well. My name is Dima Janaidi. I am a project coordinator at Palestinian Center for Communication and Development Strategies in Palestine, uh, based in Hebron, and I have Mr. Jamil Dirbashi. He's a chairman. He wants to speak uh, in Arabic, and after that I will translate for him. Al-Hudur, Tahiyati, wa Tahiyati, Usrat, Merkaz Palestine, Litsal, wa Siyasat al Tanmawiyya. لقد تم تحديد المشروع الذي عملنا عليه في الأراضي الفلسطينية في 19 مخيما من مخيمات اللاجئين والتي هي أصلا تعاني من أوضاع اقتصادية واجتماعية صعبة جدا 1900 طفل عملنا معهم خلال هذه السنة الثانية واستطعنا أن نغير كثيرا في حياة هذه الأسر ستقوم الآن زميلة ديما بعرض نتائج المشروع. Thank you so much. So let's start. I will I will start with my organization. A brief description of my organization. BCCDS is a local non-governmental non-profit organization that was established in 2009 by a group of young activists co-founded by representatives of people with hearing and visual disabilities that aims primarily to protect human rights based on international and national human law and the, the, the sustainable goals development, which is the, for, uh, the fourth goal, which is good education. BCCDS holds a lot of awards, actually. The first award was King Abdullah International Award for uh, Youth Creativity and Achievement, uh, award from the League of Arab States, uh, Ashoka International Award, Saudi Ministry of Foreign Affairs Award. And we are actually so pleasured to add Zero Project Award as the fifth on the list. It's our pleasure to have this to have this uh, award in our uh, organization, and we are very proud of our work at this project. So let me talk about my uh, uh, talk about our project. It's uh, it's called a Steps Project. We called it Steps Project because each step in this project progress successfully. Do you like to use also your presentation? You have the uh, pointer there. I would like to remind you if you want to use it. Thank. You. Okay. 
So STEPS project is a project that focus on uh, students uh, in uh, uh, with, with the aim of improving the educational outcomes of students with hearing and visual disabilities in schools located in 19 refugee camps run by the United Nations Relief and Work Agency. UNRWA, the number of target students who suffer from, he from hearing and visual disabilities is 1,900 male and female students who suffer from a decline of uh, achievement and integration and high dropout rates of schools because of their disabilities, as indicated by the records of the targeted school. The project uh, is funded by Al Madad Foundation. I would like to say ha hello to them because they are here now. They came from London actually to to uh, to to be in solidarity uh, with us. Uh, we thank you so much, uh, Almedad Foundation. Um, I will talk about the activities that implemented in the project. The first activity was a preparatory study uh, to determine the target groups and their needs. This activity actually was done by the Education Department of UNORWA and, the, and, uh, and cooperation actually with School Health Committee and schools uh, principals. Uh, after that, we form a project team consisting of a spe specialists in hearing, vision, and education for people with disabilities. After that, we make the uh, comprehensive field examinations and screens, uh, sc screenings for uh, within school using the latest technological means. After that, when we find uh, when we do the screenings for B for students, we provided students uh, with 743 uh, glasses who already have a dis a disability and a problem with the vision uh, with vision and uh, 200 uh, sorry uh, 211 hearing aids for students who have hearing disabilities after uh, jointly we train uh, teachers on the mechanism of inclusive education emotional education and active education to transfer experiences while working with the target stu students uh, as well as training the counselors uh, on mechanism of community integration for students with hearing and visual disabilities, uh, active learning activities to raise the achievement rate. After that, we uh, we have the community uh, integration activities in the school classroom and community. The innovative aspect of this project uh, was like uh, uh, launching the first mobile eye and hear health clinic that operates in refugee camp schools and is occupied with uh, the latest technological necessary to conduct examinations and screenings. Uh, conducting screenings for students within their schools, there is no, there is no, uh, there is no option to go to, to, uh, to the clinic or hospitals. We do the screenings in the uh, uh, in the schools, which contributed to raising the participation rate, uh, rate for students, giving students opportunities to choose their uh, the appropriate uh, eyeglass frame, knowing that we prepare more than 100 types of uh, frames for each school. So uh, each student actually has the right to, uh, to choose the appropriate eye frame. We didn't give them like a standard eyeglass. No, you have the opportunity to choose the proper and, and, and the one that you feel it is looks good for you. Uh, I will share like some uh, photos. Yes, here are them, some photos of screening in schools. Oh, there's all the photos actually. Let's see the photos. Yes, uh, this is the mobile uh, eye and ear clinic in refugee camp schools and screenings in the schools as well. Also screening for in the schools. They are students, they are happy with their glasses. They choose them. And here we, we did, uh, distributed the glasses were for uh, students. Yes, here we are. Integration activities. Yes. Here, I'm convincing this, uh, this girl actually to choose this glass. <laughs> she was like, oh, I'm not going to, to choose this. I told her, no, it's really beautiful on you. 
the impact we created is actually raising the achievement rate of target students with hearing and visual disabilities from 27% to 59% uh, so far, raising the integration rate of students in school and society from 16% to 67% uh, so far, reducing dropouts among students with hearing and visual disabilities, adopting an inclusive education approach in the targeted schools. The success factors uh, are as following, building a strong relationship with the education department of the International Re uh, Relief Agency, the relationship with school principals and teachers. Uh, there is a dire need actually for this service in camp schools uh, because actually in, the, in refugee camps, parents can't afford this uh, this. Uh, service for their children. Uh, they, they don't have like, they already have financial uh, problems, so they can like always have an examination screenings like six for, for six months and give them uh, glasses. So this actually, this uh, service for this uh, uh, students is really dire for uh, in the camps. Parents cooperation, extensive experience of the project stuff, and actually, of course, the presence of Amidat Foundation as the main partner in the project. Uh, about financing sustainability and challenges funding, we obtained uh, a grant from Almidat Foundation in, in the amount of 90,000. Uh, Our time is over, Dima. Can you please? But I would think about the uh, challenges. Yeah, yes. maybe during the question time, you can take questions about okay. the challenges. Thank you so much, guys. Uh, I would say one thing. It's my first time actually uh, present a conference in my life. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. It was great what you have shared with us. Actually, to see the impact, you just look at the photos, you see it there. Uh, not so much to say. Thank you so much. Now we'll continue with Sean. She's standing there. Easier for her to talk about uh, the project now. CBM's efforts in Palestine. We're listening to you. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. And thank you, Dima, and congratulations on your first presentation. Um, my name is Sean Tesney. I'm Senior Global Advisor for Inclusive Education for CBM. CBM is an international dis uh, disability and development organization committed to improving the quality of life for persons with disabilities in the poorest countries of the world. Based on over 100 years of professional experience, CBM addresses poverty as a cause and a consequence of disability and works in partnership to create a society for all. In this particular project, we have partnered with Atfaluna Society for Deaf Children in the Gaza Strip in Palestine. And the, the aim of the project is to develop an inclusive education environment for children with and without disabilities in the Gaza Strip. For this project, um, the funding has come from the European Union and CBM. Atfaluna works with the Ministry of Education and the Ministry of Health for this particular project. And it contributes towards building an inclusive society with equal access to inclusive education and accessible health services for people with disabilities in Palestine. But in today's project, I will focus on the um, education aspects of the project. Oh, too much. CBM's partnership with Atfaluna goes back nearly three decades. So we've been with them from the beginning, and now we are still with them today. It, it's, Atfaluna came from a background of supporting uh, children who are deaf and de through a development of a special school, but in recent years have opened their doors to support a range of children with disabilities to promote inclusive education. This particular innovation was developed as a result of the impact of COVID-19 when all schools were closed. And in most of our countries in the world, we all experienced the impact of the school closures and what that led to in terms of the impact on children's development. 
Atva Luna had already developed many resources in terms of teaching sign language, in teacher developing teacher capacity, vocational training, and other skills, and had a big resource library already available. But because of the impact of COVID-19, it was seen that actually a step forward to ensure that children can learn when schools are closed, regardless of the situation. Training teachers in e-learning was necessary, which took them into quite a new area. They also needed to learn the skills related to developing e-learning uh, resources. One thing is having resources available in a center, the, the, quite the other thing is to then develop those resources for use in e-learning and e-teaching, a hybrid approach to education. So the distance uh, learning methodologies were incorporated. E-learning was seen as an innovative way to provide distance education. Um, not only to develop the resources, but also to assess where the gaps were, to provide a, a way of um, targeting children's learning needs, dealing with their own individual needs as well as group needs, building platforms in ICT solutions to build the capacity of teaching staff on inclusivity and digital skills, to promote inclusive e-learning, to train parents and work with parents on how they can best support their children at home and involve other actors in the community, in education, uh, in other areas of the community and with other organisations, including for the provision of psychosocial support. And from one of the um, unexpected outcomes of the project uh, was the provision of online uh, psychosocial support. And the impact of that on the uh, of bringing the e-learning into the next national framework for inclusive education. I will now just show you some uh, online resources that have been developed. As you'll see, they're very visual. Um, they, they are accessible. They are very user friendly. They can be, there, there are video resources as well as worksheets. These can be downloaded and can be viewed when connectivity is available or when they're able to download them at home without using them offline as well. And here in this um, clip, we see a child learning at home on one level using the traditional book approach to learning, but with a nice worksheet, and on the other using a, a, a tablet to, to learn from um, the center. So teachers are delivering lessons from the centers as well as children learning at home. And many teachers report that through this learning, it has made them a better teacher. E-learning gave me the chance for to be an innovative teacher and to help parents to support their child's education at home. So that building up relationships with parents as well. There were challenges and there are challenges in terms of connectivity, meeting the diverse needs of, of learners, Providing teachers and caregivers um, information about digital learning, which is an ongoing requirement, and to develop therapeutic um, solutions from home. In order to do that, many um, downloadable resources have been produced when so connectivity is available. They are interactive, they're user friendly, and they're accessible and meet the training needs that are required. The outlook for the future is that e-learning will be included in
existing e-learning and there's ongoing therapy provided. And I'll just finish with Alma's story, a child who was very eager to learn and very frustrated when schools were closed. But online, she reports that I can continue to learn, feel safe with my family and make friends. My learning does not have to stop. Learning is my safe place. And that's so important wherever we are and wherever children are, that they feel safe in their learning, because that's when learning happens. You need to feel safe and confident. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Learning is my safe place. Very, very good sentence to maybe explain the whole impact you have created. <laughs> After Pale after examples from Palestine, now we are moving to a different region. Tiziana and Lizia will talk about the work they have done to address the challenges faced by the Ukrainian refugees. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for inviting us. Uh, so, my name is uh, Tiziana Fantucchio. I'm project officer at uh, ESPD. Uh, yes, we will show you, I'll give you uh, a brief introduction of, uh, of our project. And first of all, uh, ESPD is the European Association of Service Providers uh, for people uh, with disabilities. And uh, we are based in Brussels, in Belgium, and we represent uh, over 20,000 uh, service providers for people with disabilities uh, all over Europe. Uh, our main aim is to provide uh, uh, equal uh, opportunities for people with disabilities, and we aim to, um, to promote a high uh, quality uh, service uh, for people with disabilities, and we always try to uh, promote a person-centered and right uh, human rights-based uh, approach. Uh, Today, we are going to give you um, a presentation of our project uh, on emergency um, early childhood development support for Ukrainian refugees. Uh, we uh, started um, a partnership, a cooperation with, uh, with UNICEF uh, that lasted uh, 18 months. Uh, the project uh, ended um, last December. And our main goal was to uh, support uh, uh, Ukrainian uh, families that were displaced because of the uh, full-scale invasion. And in particular, families with uh, with children uh, with disabilities and with or at risk of developmental uh, delays. Uh, we uh, supported them um, uh, in uh, five neighboring countries. I will tell you uh, more uh, about these um, amazing partners that we, we had in a moment. And uh, what we wanted to, to achieve uh, was to give uh, direct support to uh, at least 12,000 children and families and their caregivers. Uh, uh, giving uh, support on um, early childhood intervention and uh, strengthening uh, the um, system uh, of the, the, the partner countries uh, in providing uh, ECI and ECD uh, uh, support and also um, advoc uh, advocating for uh, a greater emergency response uh, based on ECI and uh, ECD. So uh, the partnership was uh, indeed with UNICEF, and we had also um, uh, the support of uh, national offices of UNICEF, but in particular, um, the people who did uh, most of the, the job on the ground, on the field, were our uh, five, uh, six uh, um, uh, national uh, organizations in five countries. Uh, so we had Keystone in Moldova, Imago Foundation in, in Poland, Tenanet in Slovakia, and National Network for Children together with the Tea House um, in, uh, in Bulgaria and Fonds uh, for uh, Romania. And now I give the floor to, to Lisa, who was the main uh, coordinator of this project and did an amazing job. So the floor is yours. Thank you, Tiziana, for, for this presentation of me. Uh, my name is uh, Lizaveta Dranikova, and uh, I, just like Tiziana, work in ESPD as a uh, project officer. And uh, before we move on, I would like to make just a small remark um, to um, 
to what was said before. Um, I would like to say that the occupation of Ukraine lasts not since 2022, but since 2014. Uh, I think it's important to to understand the context. And um, thank you. Thank you very much. And um, so to go back to, to the amazing project that we um, or organized uh, together with our partners and about its innovative aspects. Uh, so we highlighted two things that we think are important to share. First of all, it was a, a project um, that was organized collectively in an emergency context um, between um, several countries in the region. And we think it's a very um, effective approach that can, uh, can be used uh, in the future because it allows to um, tackle uh, challenges that uh, you all well know probably uh, by now uh, together. And it allows for coordinated actions of uh, several countries at once, of many different actors also. It also allows to effectively use uh, resources such as financial resources, people resources and others. And of course, sharing of knowledge and be best practices and actually uh, utilizing this knowledge and best practices um, when it is produced at the moment. Um, and uh, last but not least, um, it allowed us to build cross-country referral pathways, meaning that some support could have um, delivered also online from people from other countries um, to, to the uh, beneficiaries. So um, um, moving on, uh, um, the um, other aspect that we wanted to highlight uh, is the um, how the uh, direct support was um, realized. It was thanks to uh, more than 500 family consultants and also more than 500 peer support facilitators who were uh, people uh, from the community uh, who were uh, trained thanks to the cascade training on um, basics of early childhood intervention, on uh, uh, psychosocial support and also uh, peer support, uh, peer support. And basically uh, these people were our Hence, let's put it this way, in um, in helping the uh, the final beneficiaries. And um, after the project was concluded, we had um, conversations with with the implementing partners, and they all say, said that this approach can be replicated in um, in emergency situations, and that it's very effective, and uh, it allows um, to engage. Um, population and uh, produce uh, more sustainable results. And it, uh, importantly also, it can, it can be used um, not only in disability sector, but also in a range of other sectors. Um, about the impact that was possible thanks to ECDUR project, uh, as Tiziana said, the initial goal was uh, 12,000 people, but uh, we managed to reach more than 20,000 people. Uh, with support, um, also in terms of work done by uh, with the governments of the five participating countries, we identified key solutions and um, challenges. Sorry, and solutions to these challenges um, to improve national systems in terms of early childhood intervention support for their citizens, but also for for the refugees. And um, we managed to raise um, this political discourse on the EU level, thanks to a um, um, series of high-level events in, in the European Union. And uh, I would pass the word to Tiziana to continue. Yes, I will just uh, briefly summarize. So the, um, uh, the the idea of the project was built indeed to create this bridge between the emergency response, but with a long-term uh, uh, ECI um, approach. So uh, what we did was to uh, um, train uh, these uh, professional uh, specialists and even if they will stay in the country or go back to Ukraine or go to other countries, they will bring this knowledge with them. We uh, managed to um, uh, trigger some, um, I would say, uh, legislative changes in the national level and as ESPD we are going on, uh, on at the EU level. Uh, here, just yes, I will uh, stop. Uh, it's just some testimonials from our family consultants and mothers that you can read. I can just read one and I close here. Uh, so from one family consultant, we had this um, feedback that I'm very glad that I joined the project by helping others. I helped myself. 
it has come a new stage in my life. So just to highlight that also family consultants were refugees uh, themselves and they and managed to, to help others. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you both that hope numbers you have reached. Congratulations with your project. Now, Johannes and Stephanie, they will present their project implemented for deaf Ukrainian refugees in Austria. I just uh, give an overview about the situation where we could learn a lot about strong points of a community like the deaf community to support each other and about services which are closely linked to the community. Uh, in Upper Austria and in other places of Austria, we have health centers for deaf people. Over 30 years, deaf staff, hearing staff, all using sign language, caring for health and social needs and being closely linked with the deaf community. And then almost two years ago, the terrible situation in Ukraine occurred. And the strong bit of, of social media, the deaf in Ukraine knew about the strong points of our region. And that was very interesting how quickly the deaf refugees came into our country. They came before the hearing came mm -hmm. and they came with family and dog and children. Mm -hmm. and even the cat. Uh, Steffi will tell about the project in detail, but I think it's very important to see the strong points of a community of people with special needs and the use of modern technology and the availability of services. Of course, we have to share, but there is a place, a safe harbor to land. And I think there's a video prepared. I hope it will work. Does it? It, it works. Yeah. It's great here. Everything works. I'm deeply impressed. Here, two years ago, a sunny day in March, they just arrived. Here is one of the deaf leaders. Andre, he is now a staff member in our uh, facility for deaf people with multiple disabilities. One of the deaf uh, refugees has teeth aches. He is one of our deaf staff and the deaf president was also there. He accompanied uh, the group. That is our house in the center of a village where we are also serving people with deafness and other disabilities. And just preparing the rooms. One of our colleagues who was very, this is a deaf president of Upper Austria, a close friend, and he took all of the staff friends to our place. Mm. Here a few images now, Steph, we will carry on and mm -hmm. speak about the details of the project and how it is long lasting and going on in, until now. Mm -hmm. But things have changed. Mm -hmm. Please, Steffi. So when the first deaf Ukrainians arrived in Linz in, um, in late February 2022, mm -hmm. We started. I should come closer. I'm sorry. <laughs> we started to support them together with the deaf community, the local federation of the deaf, and this was when the refugee project was started. So we supported um, by a variety of measures, like specially adapted accommodations with visual fire alarms, barrier free and cultural sensitive assistance in sign language and telemed courses in Austrian sign language and German written competences. Our multi-professional team consists of hearing and deaf employees from the healthcare center of the deaf and the Lebenswelt Schenkenfelden. The Lebenswelt Schenkenfelden is also part of our institute and there we provide a therapeutic community where deaf people with multiple needs and additional needs live and work there together. 
Right at the beginning, we immediately recognized that traditional refugee aid is not designed to meet the needs of deaf people. So in our close partnership with the deaf community, the local federation of the deaf, we gave rise to the idea of rethinking refugee aid. So we, this, so we think that deaf people themselves take care take over the care on site directly in the accommodations and we provide the infrastructure, the support with socio-medical know-how and, um, and act as an official accommodation provider. So this model gives us the opportunity to optimally integrate the existing services of our health centre. So, for instance, we have Chopcom, a non-formal training and educational program for deaf adults. And really, right after the beginning, they started to offer specialized language courses and cultural competence courses on site again, right after the beginning. And Parallel to this, also our job assistants supported in finding in finding workplaces and starting with job applications. So this highly networked and trans transdisciplinary working method gave us the opportunity to really save time and promote autonomy and self efficacy um, the opportunity to participate in society and in community living. And this social participation and self efficacy are the topics that drives us the most and to offer a cultural sensitive and barrier free services our aim. With our project, we hope to encourage others uh, to start and get involved in the work and care for refugees with uh, special needs and break some new ground. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing this presentation with us. Now we'll talk about natural disasters. Eva will tell us about the drought in Kenya, the project they developed because of this and the results. Um, yes, uh, thank you very much and uh, thank you all for being here and for having me. I'm very happy to be here. I know uh, it has been a long day, but it's the last session of today. So kindly bear with me uh, for the <laughs> last couple of slides. Um, for those of you who can't see me, um, I'm a white woman uh, in my 30s and I wear a red blouse and a colorful jacket to resemble um, my African colleagues. <laughs> um, as my colleague Sean Tesney was already introducing CBM, I will not go um, into that part. I will just mention that I work as a humanitarian technical advisor for our um, humanitarian inclusive action initiative for CBM based in Germany. Um, I want to give you some brief project details. Um, so the title of the project is Improved Access to Inclusive Early Childhood Care and Education for Children with and Without Disabilities in Refugee and Host Communities Communities in Kalobay and Camp Kakuma in Turkana in Kenya which is in the north of the country bordering um, Uganda, South Sudan and Ethiopia. Um, the project is funded by the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development. Uh, in German, we also say BMZ and um, an own contribution from uh, CBM. Um, our main implementing partners, and it's very important to me uh, that I also speak on behalf of them because they are the ones implementing the project on ground on a daily basis, is Waldorf Kakuma project, and I'm actually really presenting them today. And um, we involve um, with this project the Ministry of Education and the Ministry of Health, especially on county level. And um, yeah, the location I said is Camp Kalo Bay and Kakuma and the host communities around the areas. And it has um, a volume of roughly 1.4 million euros and it runs for three years. 
Um, and our overall um, objective is to improve uh, the quality and sustainability of inclusive education in the camps and host community in the area. Um, so to give you a bit um, um, an overview on the situation on the ground, as was already mentioned, um, we have um, uh, a drought and conflict prone area um, because it's um, yeah in the northern parts of Kenya, which also leads to some uh, severe food insecurity, household and malnutrition, especially amongst children below the age of five, but also um, for children with disabilities. Um, we also are facing a lot of inadequate school facilities and an insufficient number of trained and qualified teachers. And we have a very high um, number of children due to the influx of refugees. Um, so what we are trying to do with this project is um, that we do um, renovate um, educational institutions, we make them accessible, um, we provide inclusive learning equipment and we do assessments uh, with regards to uh, medical and rehabilitative services, but also educational services. Um, we also train and uh, coach uh, teachers on inclusive education. We do a lot of sensitization of parents and caregivers who um, have children with disabilities. Um, we collaborate with the county government. Um, we support local OPDs. And a very important um, part is also to raise awareness, um, especially in the very rural areas and the host communities, and to document um, these uh, best, best practices um, for others uh, to use. Um, finally, we as CBM contributed with um, an additional project for school funding as the situation on ground was so severe that we had um, the need to um, support further beyond um, the main project. Um, before I bore you with facts, I want to give you some um, impressions of the project. So on the left hand side, you can see one of our um, uh, children. Uh, her name is Josephine and she has been uh, spotted by one of our trained teachers from Waldorf Kakuma project um, and she's now uh, attending school and is very eager to learn. As you can see on the right hand side, um, she's learning to write and she's, um, yeah, she's not facing um, stigmatization much longer. So we're very happy for her to attend school. Um, these are some impressions of our assessments. On the left hand side, you can see a girl undergoing an eye test. And on the right hand side, you can see um, um, uh, a special education teacher um, um, doing an educational assessment with, uh, with a boy and uh, being attended by his family. And uh, here you can see on the left hand side, a blind OPD. Um, chairman uh, attending a um, teachers and caregivers training, uh, which is very important to sensitize them on um, how to, um, yeah, how to act with uh, children with disabilities. And on the right hand side, you can see um, our inclusive uh, education teachers training. Um, of course, uh, we face multiple uh, challenges as we are working in a multi-layered crisis. So uh, next to the safety and security situation, we have protection issues, we have accessibility issues. I don't even want to start there. Um, and facing stigmatization is still a very um, major challenge. But um, what struck me the most is uh, food security and, and wash facilities. When I visited with Sean the project um, in July last year, it was really, really uh, difficult to access portable water and water for, for hygiene in general. So that is um, um, one of the major um, challenges we were seeing. But of course, we try to provide solutions. Um, so what Waldorf Kakuma Project and CBM is doing, we're collaborating with other local actors on ground. We involve the county government, which is really crucial because they need to roadmap the way further. And um, we are hoping to strengthening localization by that. And the outlook is that we um, uh, have a potential continuation of the project maybe not with CBM, but with other interested NGOs. 
and uh, we use the lessons learned um, to replicate this project in um, other areas. And um, we, of course, want that inclusive education is embedded in the local curriculum. Um, so let me uh, end my presentation to uh, thank you all for your attention and remind us all that education is a human right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. Thank you all for the great presentations. Now it's time for us for the questions and answers. I'm sure you have your questions as you have listened to various different, but all very successful projects. Who would like to be the first, please? Yes, that was left. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. But I was going to raise it. Yes, yes please. actually there were a lot of challenges in the project. Uh, the first one was the widespread need uh, in refugee camps for this uh, service in the camps, especially regarding the classes because the extensive use of um, mobile, mobile and uh, technological devices. Uh, the difficult security conditions in Palestine, uh, in the targeted Palestinian camps in the West Bank, and the inability for uh, for us as as the team of the project to go through uh, the camps because uh, the repeated closures uh, in the West Bank schools. But you know we are Palestinians, so we always have a plan B. So we have to go to the schools and to 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 the camps in order to have uh, to give every student the right to to be screening and to have the glasses or uh, hearing aid if he wants. Yes, that's it. Great. Congratulations, really. <laughs> really. All right. Uh, so do you have questions for other panelists, please? Yes, please. Hello, this is Edward Winter from World Vision. Um, so I'm just wondering uh, for any of the panelists, um, were you able to collaborate with mainstream um, humanitarian actors? Were they interested in supporting disability issues? So any lessons learned from that, positives or negatives? I'd just be really interested. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Uh, I think many can answer maybe. Who would like to go first? Leonis. Uh, I think one has to collaborate and one has to make them open to adapt to special needs and to involve other stakeholders as well. And also a money thing. Uh, it's in our country also a part of a business to have services for people with uh, refugee backgrounds. And uh, there's also a bad side of the story. One has to always be aware of that, and we took a lot of uh, services on our shoulders without having the fundings, but we got support from donors and so forth. So it's always an interesting tension uh, to enter the refugee, refugee field, which is not mainly adapted to the special needs field. Mm -hmm. Well, anybody who would like to say a few more things? Yes, please. Mm -hmm. Um, Agdur project. Uh, actually, if I understand correctly, by mainstream humanitarian actors, it means big international organizations, right? So, actually, yeah, our project was organized in partnership with UNICEF and uh, specifically UNICEF uh, Regional Office for Europe and Central Asia. And yes, they have a um, Structural. Uh, um, they have a, a, a place that uh, deals with um, early childhood intervention, and we collaborated with them in developing this project and also in realizing this project. And uh, indeed, there is a huge interest and also a huge wealth of information and knowledge on uh, how to work in this field. Uh, so that that's from our experience. And uh, thank you for the question. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions for our panelists, for Sean, Eva, or uh, who else didn't have a word? I think Sean and Eva can say, can answer some questions. If you have any, do you have? 
All right, let me continue then because I have raised some questions for you, uh, Resort. Sean, uh, I remember the last sentence, learning is my safety. So how can you elaborate on the role of family and the caregiver involvement in the remote learning process? Thank you for that um, question. Whichever, whatever situation you're in and wherever you are learning, the role of the family is key. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't have to be in a situation of crisis. I think it's just um, an important issue. What is challenging very often is, and I've heard it today in other sessions earlier, is that sometimes it's 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 gaining that parental involvement. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes it's lack of confidence. Sometimes it's the family facing stigma themselves within the community where they are living. But what I think is positive through this particular project, if I take it yeah. back to this one, the learning is that actually building that relationship with parents at home, that ongoing teacher parent relationship, because some of these relationships are not with specialist teachers, mm -hmm. they are with the mainstream teachers. Mm -hmm. So, and I think that sometimes lacks that sensitivity of how you work with particularly children with diverse learning needs or disabilities. Mm -hmm. Atvaluna is um, a partner which has a wealth and a, um, a long engagement with families, with parents. And particularly, I think I, I wanted to expand a little bit on that psychosocial support because I think working with families means that you also need to provide that psychosocial support, yeah. again, regardless of the situation. Mm -hmm. But I, I am aware that for for a, um, our partner at Faluna, even before uh, this project started, they were very much working on the psychosocial needs of their children mm -hmm. and their families. So much so, actually, they had brought out um, uh, a guide which CBM, um, with BMZ, um, with the International Centre of Evidence on Disability at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, published in order to guide uh, particularly working with children who are deaf and hard of hearing. Mm -hmm. So I think it's bringing all those pieces together mm -hmm. that's really yeah. important and building on those skills mm -hmm. and going forward. I hope that answers your question, yes, but course. come back to me if you, <laughs> something is missing. Yes, very detailed answer. Thank you <laughs> Thank so you. much. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, any questions from the platform? Yes, please. Uh, the service is ongoing even in our days with the, in the Gaza Strip. Yes, it's a very uh, a challenging question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm sure many will appreciate that it is a very sensitive time. Um, what my understanding is that Atva Luna has uh, maybe required to change some of the activities, but is ongoing providing activities particularly psychosocial support mm -hmm. and helping people to access um, what support there is available. So mm -hmm. that's my understanding. Mm -hmm. I can't speak on behalf of our partner. Mm -hmm. I'm not there, but that's my understanding. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the question. Yeah, well needed, right. All right, anybody who would like to raise a question from the floor, please? If not, Eva, I have one. <laughs> Uh, about the impact, I would like to ask you, what do you think is the biggest impact of CBMs and their partners' work in this area? Um, thank you for the question. Um, I think uh, we have um, quite a manifold impact. So I think, first of all, it's important to note that we are laying the focus on inclusive education in humanitarian settings. So. Um, which is often difficult because I was I, as I was trying to 
um, present in my presentation, we have so many other challenges to face, like wash, food security, protection, safety, security. So a lot of other actors um, are arguing, why would you lay your focus on inclusive education? Um, then I think as a second point, um, we um, engage the community, which is really key, as Sean was on and the other colleagues were already mentioning. So family, the community, um, the teachers, and sensitize them also around um, stigmatization and disability. And uh, thirdly, I think it is very well um, accompanied um, by the medical and educational assessments, because often they are children with disabilities, but people don't know about them or don't know how to deal with them. So these assessments are really crucial to actually know how many children with disabilities are there because we don't have reliable data in, in these areas. And then finally, I think it's also about um, strengthening the local economy by using local supplies and, and um, yeah, working only with local structures, but also um, yeah, involving the county government because eventually we are trying to, you know, to advocate that they um, embed inclusive education within the curricula. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have a couple of more minutes, so I can raise um, two more questions, maybe. One to Tiziana and Lisa. Uh, can you tell us more about the roles of family consultants and peer support facilitators? How did you select these people? Yeah. How did their work look day to day basis? And what influence do you think it has on young children from Ukraine and the families? Thanks a lot for this question. Indeed, uh, it's very interesting. And um, so, yeah, we had these uh, two main groups of people, family consultants and peer supporters. and. Uh, uh, family consultants were people with some prior um, experience in work with children, either in early childhood intervention or even teachers uh, or um, doctors uh, with some experience, again, uh, with children, uh, while peer supporters were um, parents. And uh, in most of the cases, they were uh, themselves parents of children with disabilities. And most of them um, came originally from Ukraine, uh, but we also coupled them with uh, with some local uh, people and they were working in multidisciplinary teams. Um, so with other specialists, they were trying either to solve uh, the issues of the families if they could, if they had the capacity and expertise on the spot or in most of the cases, refer them to to the um, professionals or to uh, um, other uh, members of this of the same group, and importantly, uh, the work uh, was on the cases. So it it has never been um, almost never been one session when a, a person would come with a child and uh, say uh, we have a problem one hour and it's finished. No, they they would come with a child and the work would always be done with the family on the case. Uh, so multiple session until the um, problem at stake or issue were solved. And uh, it's also important uh, just to sum up um, how their work looked like. Uh, initially, it wasn't that easy to start this work rolling because people were so focused on um, securing, you know, basic needs such as accommodation, food, um, jobs, but it uh, came very soon as a realization that uh, it's very important to provide support to young children, um, especially those with disabilities or developmental delays, because this time is so precious mm -hmm. uh, while the child is developing and has this neuroplasticity of their brain that um, yeah, we we also managed to push the message that it is important not to waste mm -hmm. any minute. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, then my last question is a common one. Uh, when a crisis occurs, many institutions who do not work in the field of humanitarian response primarily also want to take action. What would you what would be your first recommendations to these institutions at this point? What is the first thing to pay attention to in inclusive 
emergency response. Maybe I'll just get the ball rolling. Right. By the way, I forgot to um, describe myself, <laughs> which I suddenly realized I'm around five foot four, <laughs> fair hair in my 60s. Um, I wear glasses and today I'm wearing a black dress and an orange uh, leather jacket. Coming back to the question, not avoiding it, <laughs> I would say one of the first um important uh things that we need to find out is where are people with disabilities living you know and where where are the organizations of persons with disabilities who can assist us to detect where people are living because until you've done the mapping of where people are because what what i've seen in cbm's work in um different emergencies is that when we've been able to have that mapping where where we know where people with disabilities are living when there is a disaster or a crisis they know where to go they know where they are living they know who which messages they need to 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 bring if somebody who is deaf living in a house how will we make sure that they get the message, someone who's blind or with low vision, ensuring that somebody helps to get them to safety, et cetera, et cetera. I don't want to go into uh, more detail, but I would, for me, yeah. working with organizations of persons with disabilities, preparedness mm. of um, school children to the community when things happen, because increasingly, like it or not, all our communities are in danger of some disaster or conflict or other. Um, so we need to be prepared wherever we are. That's that's my, that's my two penneth worth and yeah, very getting the ball rolling. <laughs> getting prepared for any kind of crisis, having a plan, maybe not a very big one, but something, yes. Maybe just in addition to what uh, Sean said and um, about the mapping on ground, I think it is really key before you start getting into a situation to have an inclusive rapid needs assessment and the focus lies on inclusive um, to, to be inclusive, um, which means it's just underlining what Sean already says is that you involve OPDs and that you involve persons with disabilities within these assessments. Otherwise, um, it doesn't present a holistic overview. Thank you. Any more contribution? Yes, yes I have uh, to add one thing more. Uh, actually, the impact that we created uh, in this project is the first one actually at most important thing is increasing the uh, the confidence with children who is uh, who are actually uh, disabled because uh, they have to lead community activities in school so they have th that confidence that i am able to do this thing i am able to practice i am i am I'm, I'm able to participate in school activities and the second one actually is establishing the first school for vocation uh, for vocational education in hebron because uh, students after secondary school, they have no place to go there. So actually, we are on the way to establish this school for students, uh, for deaf students in Hebron, in H2 actually area, because it's the most uh, marginalized area in Hebron. So we are, uh, we have just like uh, ab some approval to, to, to take this project. Uh, there's a, th there will be a sp uh, special, uh, courses for this students okay. yes technical school for the students who already have their needs actually to have a place uh, to go there yes yeah that's it all right now we're coming to the end of our session i would like to congratulate all panelists for the hard work and sharing with us the uh, projects and the results they have achieved we witnessed that inclusivity and accessibility for persons with disabilities can sometimes be overlooked in moments of crisis and humanitarian emergencies. But the successful examples today we have listened, we have heard that we, they can serve as a good model for institutions worldwide. 
Thank you for everyone for participating to our sessions. I hope you enjoyed.